Hello, my name is Sean Argyle, and I'm a doctoral student of curriculum and instruction at Kent State University. This presentation, entitled Mathematical Thinking, Can We Ever Agree on a Definition, is a preliminary report on the results of my dissertation. The word splash you see in front of you is a collection of words taken from keywords in the articles used for the meta-analysis. There are quite a few of them, and they're all closely related, and this chaos that you see before you is representative of the literature as a whole. Or at least that's what I thought. If you look at the variety of policy documents on how teaching should proceed for a mathematics classroom, they all use a phrase along the lines of mathematical thinking. Pictured here is one such quote from the NCTM Principles and Standards published in 2000. The real problem is that no one ever comes up with a good definition of mathematical thinking in any of these documents. Certainly, lists of characteristics exist, but they all tend to be rather arbitrary and you have no idea where they came from. Part of the problem may stem from the fact that researchers themselves really don't understand what the phrase means, and they often disagree with each other in the literature. Uh, here you can see a quote of a couple of researchers lamenting the fact that we may never really come to any sort of agreement whatsoever. Without some sort of consensus in the literature, one wonders how is a teacher supposed to improve mathematical thinking in their students? And that is the purpose of the study that I'm conducting for my dissertation. Uh, here you can see my guiding research questions. Basically, what I want to know is what is mathematical thinking, who does it, when and how, and what can teachers do to make that happen? I decided that the best way to go about finding my answers was with a meta-analysis. There are already so many conflicting definitions in the literature that one more definition, especially from an untested doctoral student, didn't seem to make any sense. The journal I selected for my meta-analysis was Mathematical Thinking and Learning. The title alone seems to make it a good choice, but here you can see a bulleted list of the things that they like to see in the articles submitted to them, many of which discuss mathematical thinking. For a long time I was stymied about methodology. How does one go about coming up with the definition of a word? Here you can see famous philosopher Quine asking that very question about the word bachelor. I briefly considered grounded theory, as that seemed to be the only way to come up with a new generation rather than to simply verify. However, its positivist roots simply made it untenable for an open-ended question like this. After a great deal of time trying to force grounded theory to fit in a study that was really not intended for it, I selected conceptual analysis. Here you can see the book Thinking with Concepts by John Wilson, which I used as my guide. My selection was again inspired by Quine, who once upon a time gave the parable of a rabbit being called Gavagai to explain that it's difficult to come up with a definition of a word outside of how it's actually used by people. And that's what conceptual analysis is all about. Looking at words, how are they being used, why are not other words being used here, and that really gets you at what the meaning of the word happens to be. At this point, you've got a good sense about how I went through. More specifically, I did extensive line-by-line -line analysis of 50 of the 200 or so articles that are available at the time in mathematical thinking and learning. I also did key point analysis of another 75 or 100. The remaining simply just did not have enough to do with mathematical thinking or were just too far from the central topic to be of any use. Once I'd read the 50 most important articles in my meta-analysis, I began to realize it wasn't so much that the authors were conflicting with each other, they weren't really talking about the same thing. Here you see an image of blind men trying to determine the nature of an elephant. Much as I am trying to define the nature of mathematical thinking, these blind scientists are trying to define the meaning of an elephant. However, because the elephant is so big and they are blindfolded, they can only see small portions of the thing at a time. And by see, I mean touch. And so you get a spear at one end and a rope at the other. Mathematical thinking turned out to be a lot like this. They were all talking about small facets of the process, and consequently, they all sounded like they were talking about a completely different thing. It was only when I said, what if they're all right simultaneously, even though they're talking about completely different things, seemingly. That's when I had my breakthrough. 
there are two important caveats I must make about my, well, everyone might be right at the same time, attitude. The first one is that when you look at the literature, you find conflicting definitions. Here you can see two definitions of mathematization, which both authors believe come in horizontal and vertical formats. Bonato, on the left there, believes that horizontal mathematization is the movement from situations in which mathematics is utilized to the underlying mathematical structure and vice versa. Long story short, Bonato believes horizontal mathematization is when you decide whether something is or is not mathematical. If you look at Rasmussen, Zendaya, King, and Teppo, however, they believe the same thing to be vertical mathematization. It is only if you can get past these seeming contradictions and realize that underneath it all, they're really talking about the same thing that you can find consensus in the literature. The second important caveat about my everyone might be right methodology is that there are strong epistemological differences from one author to the next. On the left, you can see that Ginsburg and C.O. really believe that mathematics is inherent to the world and has a sort of capital T truth about it, apart from humans. On the right, you see that Sinclair believes that mathematics is a social construction. The, that math may or may not be out there, doesn't matter, we create it, or we create how we talk about it. These are very different epistemologies, and if you get fixated on the epistemology, you get nowhere. What's important to notice is that whether or not it really exists, whether or not it exists independently of humans, both groups basically believe that there is some sort of mathematical world. It just depends on whether or not it's out there. Mathematicians, in both cases, act as if it is there. It doesn't matter or not if it is actually philosophically there. And so my research takes on a post-epistemological attitude about this, in that we're not going to ask those questions, they don't help us come to answers. With these caveats in mind, what I present to you is the model that I'm going to be defending in my dissertation. As you can see, it has five important nodes, mathematics and everyday experience. On the left and right, you can see two other nodes, the mathematical disposition, which is rather like the subconscious of the mathematical thinker, and the mathematical community, which is other mathematical thinkers and how they influence one individual mathematical thinker. This is sort of the socio-cultural axis. It's important to note that there is no internal hierarchy and the orientation of this could easily be changed. What really makes this meta-analytic model work is the central node, sense-making. This was a piece that, while rarely explicitly discussed in the literature, was present in almost every article in one way or another, and I realized that this was the piece to connect the sociocultural with the cognitive with the identity development and roll it all together into one big model. If you really forced me to make a decision and say that one specific thing was the quintessential aspect of mathematical thinking, sense-making would be it. There's a constant swirl of information coming in from the other four sources and it's up to the mathematical thinker to decode them and that's what's going on in sense-making. All the arrows that you see going on around sense-making are how the mathematical thinker interacts, giving or taking, from a particular node. The most important thing to understand about this model is that unlike linear, discrete models that precede stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, and so forth, this is a continuous model that focuses on cycles. Virtually all of the connections you see on the model are two-way. The only exceptions are listed here in dotted lines. The one-way connections, labeled with dotted lines, are not really part of mathematical thinking, but they're in a sense inseparable. For example, it would be impossible for one person to totally create all of mathematics from scratch. Consequently, it's necessary for a mathematical thinker to just simply accept certain mathematical facts as true without verifying them. That is listed here as pre-mathematized information. Similarly, it's very difficult to think of someone coming to a traditional understanding of mathematics without some form of instruction, which is also labeled with a one-way dotted line. 
As for the rest, abstraction most typically proceeds into generalization or reification, but it could also proceed to internalization or any of the other arrows that stem from sense making. It doesn't really matter, although certainly some loops are more common. For example, mathematization often precedes justification, but it's not necessarily so. Thank you very much for watching my video. More information will be available once I defend my dissertation. Stay tuned for perhaps publications and a more detailed video on the individual arrows in the model. Have a nice day.